Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 75. On today's episode, I have Chip Nellinger from Boulder Fagger Marketing and Kirk Hens from Bam Weather going to talk about uh, the markets and what they see happening in the forecast moving in through the end uh, of the week. And also I have my two cohorts here, Aaron Fennell and Regina Nargis. And uh, so, Chip, the uh, markets kind of started out down, but they tried to climb their way out. Yeah, a little kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, Beans uh, took out uh, out of the gate running. We had some news over the weekend uh, that President Trump is uh, starting to possibly um, lighten, soften his tone a little bit in regards to this uh, Chinese trade issue. They're going to meet this week, hopefully get something resolved. But the bean market's assumption right now is that uh, they are going to, it's, it's going to be a positive result in uh, lessening the trade tensions. So you had uh, July beans up 14 and a half today. Uh, nice recovery after getting uh, pummeled last week. New crop beans up nine at 1023. Uh, corn was caught in the middle, sharply unchanged today. Uh, 396 and a half unchanged in July corn. Uh, the wheat market got hit a little bit, down seven and a half in the uh, Chicago, down eight and a quarter in Kansas City. Uh, some rain on the way for some of the dry areas of Kansas. Um, so we'll see. Weather's still part of this. We had the um, crop progress, planting uh, progress here. Corn, 62% planted. That was a little bit higher than uh, the average estimate was 59%. So we did make good progress last week. Still the northern areas, uh, northern Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, they've been pretty wet. Uh, They're lagging a little bit. Bean planting, also a touch higher than expected. Uh, The market was looking for 30% complete. We came in at 35 uh, and spring wheat, same story there. Their market was looking for 52%. We came in at 58%. Uh, we also got uh, wheat conditions, 36% good to excellent. Um, up a couple points from a week ago, the market was kind of anticipating unchanged. So nothing really bullish in this uh, planning progress or wheat condition report. That's going to probably weigh on things. Uh, but you know, we're back to the same old uh, issue again that we talked about for a couple of weeks, and that is, uh, are we going to get the trade issue with China figured out? Uh, is anything going to be announced this week? Are we going to see, uh, you know, 19 headlines of which half of them are going to be fake news affect this market? So uh, stay tuned for that. Probably Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there's more of that stuff to hit. Uh, so uh, kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, livestock markets uh, kind of got beat up, uh, essentially closing the limit down in the June. Um, three bucks lower, 104.62. Cash trade a little bit weaker last week on Friday, uh, a couple bucks lower. Uh, so starting to tone off a little bit negative here. Um, but I don't think it's something we're just going to totally fall apart. We still have a huge discount um, in June futures compared to where the most recent cash trade is. Hogs, a nice day, 105 higher at 76.15. So at least the hog market was able to. Uh, Catch, uh, catch up and you know recover some of Friday's sharp losses. Right on. All right, Chip, so, okay, Wednesday, Chinese thing's supposed to be hopefully at least negotiated, talked about at least a little bit more. So until then, do you just kind of see everything just kind of in limbo, just kind of waiting and see what, what kind of comes out of that? Probably a little bit of limbo. And, and actually, there's no set um, time. I, I think that uh, they're in route today, maybe starting the meetings tomorrow. So I think it's probably going to be later in the week. Uh, that you see uh, last half of the week at least that you see some news and some stories out of this uh, uh, you know china u.s trade negotiation until then uh you know i think probably slop around a little bit this report here planning progress to me says we probably uh you know start the overnight trade a little bit lower but uh, you know chop around until we know a little more about this china trade issue uh, there's also some renewed optimism that uh, we're going to get NAFTA uh, kind of complete here in short order, but uh, you know, so that may be a couple, two, three weeks out before we uh, find out more about that. All right, man. Well, if guys want to get a hold of you and continue this conversation, how would they do that? Yeah, best way is just call our office here, 309 550 7213. I'd love to chat with you about your risk management plan and uh, how we might be able to help uh, improve that and uh, execute that for you. Right on. All right, Chip. Well, we'll catch you tomorrow, and hopefully we have some exciting news to talk about. Let's hope so. All right. Thanks, Chip. All right. Thanks. All right, Kirk. Uh, Hens from Bam Weather's coming up here next. So, Kirk, what do you see happening in the, uh, you know, like Chip kind of hit into, there's some dry weather out there. It looks like 
guys have got some pretty good conditions and going to be some needed rains that come through. So what do you see happening over the uh, course of the week here? Yeah, so a couple stats I wanted to throw out to you guys. So we are currently moving in on the warmest May on record. We had the, the like the third coldest April on record. We're working with the warmest May on record, and we just – we continue to see that warmth continue basically through the second half of the month. So not only are we going to be dealing with warmth, just the models continue to, to dry up with the exception of like Eastern Nebraska, Northern Iowa, Southern Minnesota, the same areas that have continued to get hit. I think later this week, into this weekend, continue to get another round of some moderate to heavy rainfall as well. So I can continue to see some of those delays in those areas have been a little bit cooler as well. I, I can continue to see uh, that, that being a little bit more of an issue in those areas. But what's also interesting is uh, it's one of the driest months on record with precipitation here in the Ohio Valley, specifically Indianapolis. We picked up 0.2 inches of rainfall the entire month. And uh, you know, the, the forecast ahead looks very bleak. I mean, uh, we average 5.1 inches of rain for the entire month. So, you know, uh, we have a lot of catching up to do in the forecast models to the next 10 days, basically the rest of the month have near less than an inch of rainfall in there. So we are drying out in a big way in the Ohio Valley. I think we're going to see that show up on the drought monitor this week. I mean, we're really concerned with how dry things are picking up. And that's part and due to the warmth, too. I mean, we're dealing with record warmth. We're really exposing how dry we really are. So I would expect those drought conditions to continue to, to get a little bit stronger and move a little bit further northeast to where they are across the southwestern plains right now. Right. So very first uh, podcast we had you on, way back when you talked about some long range uh kind of estimates that you saw happen out there going out through the yeah. end of the summer and, and you weren't sure. very weren't, weren't very positive on moisture for uh <laughs> basically everything of the, of the east of the eastern corn belt so yeah. you still seeing the same thing you still feel like it's going to be yeah. pretty hot dry summer if anything our signals have only gotten stronger and just to be honest we're seeing a lot of research models are actually starting to trend a little bit warmer to what our initial thoughts were I think the warmest of the warm is going to be focused west of the Mississippi. I think that's where the driest of the dry is too. But mm-hmm. I mean, I, that may shift a little bit further east. You know, if, if we continue to see no rainfall the next 10 days, we're going to highly consider moving the driest areas a little bit further east too, and possibly even into the, the Ohio Valley, you know, as part of the Tennessee Valley as well. So I, I still think that warmer and drier look overall is still well on the table. Okay. So let's talk about South America now. So. It's yeah. been dry, been wet, been dry, been wet. So where where are we at yeah. now down there? And what's that look? What's the uh, long range forecast look for yeah. down that part of the world? Yeah. So for for basically the entire month, the past forty five days, Argentina has been getting barraged by a ton of rainfall. So that will have a relief for the next seven to ten days. There's not a whole lot in the way of precipitation. So I do expect some movement probably a little bit at least in the, in the remaining soybean harvest down there. Uh, I do see potential for around, I would say, the 18th to the 20th for southeastern Brazil, kind of that second crop, the free crop, to see a storm. Now, oftentimes when it's really dry, models overestimate rainfall. I personally am in that camp. I don't think we see anywhere near the inch, inch and a half amounts of rainfall that the European and the GFS model are trying to put down there across Mato Grosso de Sol, Sao Paulo, and into Piranha, some of that Safrina corn crop area. So it's something to watch. The trend, however, is that we flip right back to dry, you know, the following week to end May to open June. So basically what I'm saying is any kind of rainfall that moves through is temporary and does not help the situation down there. Right on. Okay, man. Well, if uh, folks yeah. want to get some more information about about your stuff, the, the services that you have, and, and just check up on your, your Twitter yeah. feed, where would they find you at? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Head on over to our website, bamwx.com. We have samples on there. Um, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter, bamwx.com, where we're happy to answer any messages or, or tweets or anything and kind of help you get what you're looking for here. All right, man. Well, Kirk, man, appreciate it, and uh, we'll catch you next week, buddy. All right, appreciate All right. it, man. Thanks a lot, bud. We'll see you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yep, see you. Bye. Kirk out. All right. So now we've got all kinds of great news and wonderful things to talk about. What? Uh, First and foremost. What's that? What is today? Today is the one. This is our one year anniversary here at the uh, Moving Iron Podcast. 
monument. Woo-hoo! I mean, we're probably, I don't know, we've got a solid 15 people out there now that listen to this podcast day in and day out. So I want to give a special shout out to all the, all the troopers out there that have uh, gone through all of the uh, bad editing <laughs> and late night posts and everything else that's been out there. So without, without all you guys, man, I appreciate it. It's been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. And these two here have made, made my life significantly easier since, since then. So I'm Jack. Significantly easier. Yeah. yeah. Significantly. That's usually tied to my name. <laughs> Often. <laughs> we were gonna have we we're gonna have a whole bunch of party streamers and and a whole bunch of other folks come strolling through here, but they all canceled the last minute, so you got stuck with us here. So somebody said something about budget issues. <laughs> that, could, that could have been part of it. Budget issues could have been a major part of that. Could have been a major part of that. So what is going on? Happy Mother's Day, a day late. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank Happy you. Mother's Day. <laughs> What uh, what did you do to to enjoy your Mother's Day? Weekend? Well, um, we were in a part of the world that didn't necessarily get rain, but we had enough of a mist that yeah. that stopped our planters from rolling. So we actually caught up on some of our cow stuff. We worked the last few of our cows and branded the last few of our calves, last thirty calves that we had that were kind of late to the to the game, I guess. Um, got that done and moved some of them out to pasture and got cut up in some of that stuff. I got my garden planted. There you go. Spend some time with my kids there and my husband. Oh, that's just rare this time of year sometimes. Yeah, I, I <laughs> did you call your mom? Time. I did. Good. I called my mom. And I tried to call my grandma, but she didn't call me back. So happy Mother's Day, Grandma, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Which I doubt. But uh, um, your weekend, how'd it go? Good. Good. Graduation. Oh, yeah. Girlfriend's son graduated. and Yeah. Had to do the whole, get ready for the whole party thing Saturday, do that. Graduation day yesterday. Do chores in between. Yeah. That was, that was the world. Did you, uh, did you kill some worlds? No. No? No. Did not. Didn't sling any silver bullets, huh? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about a few things here. So let's just hit the wholesale marketplace real quick and what you see happening. Kind of the slow time of the year for us. I'm not as busy this time of the year as, as most as the other side of the business is. So it seems like the uh, wholesale market has picked up, though. Um, things are definitely kind of moving in that post-harvest direction kind of early. And it feels like there's getting to be some combine talk and some combine activity that you can kind of see this time of the year. But I, it feels like there's a lot more things going on, at least inquiries about that stuff now mm-hmm. than, what, than what you're seeing. What are you what are you seeing out there? Um, t- which is typical people right. that know us. I see it as the complete opposite. I think it's a little slower mm-hmm. it, from from a wholesale combine standpoint. I feel like it's a slower start, you know, to the pre summer harvest, right. super post planning. Now yep. the next thing I'm going to need is a combine talk. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of late to the table. But there is some, you know, I've got lots of guys working on combine, you know, that I'm, that I'm working on combine deals with. And it's just, yeah, I like that, but I just don't care right now. Right. You yeah. know, so yeah. there, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and that's probably the main thing. There's a little bit of sprayer action out there here and there mm-hmm. um, for the right unit. And it you know what is the right unit there's no ace in the hole right now other than of course something cheap you know a a 30 series with some hours on it is a pretty hot thing um just because there Mm -hmm. might be a pull type getting replaced you know Mm -hmm. the guy's done burned down with it or whatever and he's just like ugh, i need a self-propelled um batter he's got a 10 series 20 series off you know different color red yellow what have you a mm-hmm. um, little bit of action in that world so you know there's some it's definitely slower than I'd like to see it right now but stuff you know still moving right. still moving iron <laughs> <laughs> all right Gina so talk about what you're seeing out there on the on the Twitterverse there looks like plenty of activity going 
some guys are all the way done planting, some guys are sort of done planting, some guys are just not getting started as we heard there you go so yep what's kind of some of the conversations you've been kind of looking at and been a part of on on the internets there yeah i think um kind of like aaron said the wholesale market's kind of a little bit quiet right now just because there is so many people still in the field trying to get things going but um it's starting to kind of turn around where guys are starting to look forward to harvest time to wheat harvest time um you know the wheat the wheat tour that just wrapped up here was not great Right. Um, so I think it has definitely some people concerned as to how they're going to get their crop out of the field yep. and what it's going to cost them. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that are probably used to having something done customly or looking at seeing if they can get into a cheap combine right. just to control some cost. Yep. Um, you know, and kind of what best fits their operation. I've seen some movement towards that, which is always kind of startling a little bit. But um, and as far as like ours, you know, for our guys, it seems like. They've gotten a little bit of momentum here recently, um, but overall, I think the overall feeling is that everybody's kind of satisfied. You know, at first, before when nobody was planting, everybody was kind of like in a yeah. panic a little bit, and now it seems like you know it doesn't take very long to get a lot of corn in the ground. So right. yeah. now it seems God, like no. the the mood is lightened a little bit as far as planting goes, and there's still plenty of corn that needs to be put in the ground. I'm not downplaying that at all, but. Um, definitely seems like the mood has lightened a little bit out there. Well, I think about it. The last two weeks went from I think it was fifteen percent to sixty-two yeah. percent in in fourteen days. So it doesn't take a long time to put crop in the ground anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's God bless the uh, size of planters and the speeds of tractors and technology and everything else that goes with that. Because otherwise we'd be struggling and year in and year out to get all this taken care of. So let's uh. Let's talk about this, for example. So, Aaron, you and I had a conversation the other day. Where we were talking about um, kind of some what ifs, right? And one of the what ifs I came up with was what if Caterpillar, when they introduced in '87 the the flat track 65A, which wasn't an A then, but a 65A, 65 or 75s, and those kind of tractors that came through. It was unique. No, there's never been there wasn't any track machines except for the like the 30 years prior there was the crawlers and those kind of things that came through but my my what if was let's just say caterpillar decided that they were going to have the uh articulated tractor but they were just going to use their wheel loader platform and they introduced that we could easily had the whole horsepower rush that we saw from through the 80s into the 90s could have been greatly expanded because they could have rolled out a 500 horsepower articulated four-wheel drive tractor in 1987 had they gone that route or they could have used one of their high track dozers that were already out there and just configured it to be a, a farm tractor right but my thought was i don't know that it would have changed that it would have changed anything that they would have been a dominant player any more than what they were to start with but i think it could have i think they could still have had a place in today's marketplace had they done that what's your what's your take on that okay i think of course, complete opposite. Shocker. <laughs> in 1987, you had Ford New Holland, right? Case I H, yep. John Deere, uh, 87, Dutes Alice, mm-hmm. Massey, um, White, still at that point. Um, so that's six companies, okay? Of those six companies, three. And in 87, yeah, Case IH would have just bought Steiger, so they disappeared. It, at that point, for articulated foil drives, you had the Ford Versatile. You had the Steiger painted red. You had the, <laughs> you had the John Deere. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and actually, yeah, yeah, in 87, that would have been right. And so that's three, okay? That's three articulated wheel tractors the best thing that cat did is they created a market no absolutely from scratch yeah. there was no such thing ever in the history of mankind as that tractor okay so had they have just come out with i'll, g- I'll give you a current day scenario okay had they have just come out with a articulated tractor they immediately would have had followers because it had 
cat on the side. Right. You know, it's cat. It's not junk, it's cat. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was an incredible uphill climb to get into that market because you have so many players up here Mm -hmm. and as far as, you know, you had your, your loyal, loyal, versatile guys for years that was a rugged, dependable, pretty aggressively priced tractor. You had your John Deere guys that, you know, there's plenty of, plenty, plenty, plenty of John Deere fans out there that, Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing better than a deer. Won't even listen. Um, Your Steiger guys changed color, but it was the same tractor. Right. Um, And that was, you know, in my opinion, you know, that, that's a very even machine with your versatile. You know, you take the old, the old, the versatile pre-Ford and you take the Steiger pre-case and they both just made foil drives and that was it, you know. And your versatile was a little more rugged, a little more, you know, a little more competitively priced. Your Steiger was your, ooh, this one's fancy, you know. So you, they they were really hammering on the market at that point. Um, so they would have had a big, big uphill climb, even though it was a cat, cat engine, you know, cat drivetrain, all that. Big uphill climb. They made their own trucks here recently. Diesel truck, yeah. Yeah. You don't see them blowing up and down the interstate all over the place. No, but they also made those in a transitionary period. Right. When when the final tier four on road final tier four engine was coming through, right. and it was that 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 rollout across the entire industry. I don't care if it was Pete Kenworth, Cat, whoever it was, was the biggest cluster that would ever, oh, yeah. ever happen. Yeah, right, absolutely. I mean, they <laughs> it went they that that engine that got produced was had more issues with it. I don't care who was producing the engine; there was just catastrophic problems from the word go. Right. My point on the articulated full drive thing is to your point that the caterpillar name. Mm-hmm. Now, they would have made an immediate splash when they came in. Immediate. You know what I mean? They would have taken the guys that were on the fence of of whether they really wanted to have that color, they would have immediately taken those folks that would have been anything. I think they could have opened up with twenty percent of the market had they done that. Even if but, they even if they <coughs> went to market with even if they went to market with the four-wheel drive track, or not the four-wheel drive track, the, the dozer track, <coughs> high track stuff that they had, then if they would have done that, they would have had something like nobody else had, but they just had a bulldozer they took the blade off the front. But what would be the advantage of having the high track versus the flat track? High track, you have more, you have greater amount of track, so you have more more uh, track to the ground, and then you have greater horsepower to the ground because there's less slippage because you're running it through one giant deal and instead of it being just a linear track it's this way and it makes a big difference i know but and that back to my point the the greatest thing they did was create their own market there is no uphill climb you are it but they could have think about this think if they would have went back with the whole like you know a lot of companies have done it where they've tried to go back like for example new holland has tried to go back with the boomer series you know which is the kind of throwback to like the eight in they're kind of trying to build off that heritage that of that whole ford tractor they could have done the exact same thing with the Caterpillar crawler like they had back in the 30s and in the 40s and had the same thing. They could have even gone crazy and painted it gray and red again. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? And like had that whole nostalgic feel like my great-grandpa had one of these and right. was still at the farm type of thing. I think I think they could have made a, a bigger splash. I mean, granted, what they did was very innovative and it was a hell of a good tractor. But it was one of those things where they, they introduced the track market in and it, even to this day, the track market's probably grown Significantly, I would say in the last ten years than what it had done in you know. From, oh yeah, it's grown more in the last ten years than it did from nineteen eighty seven to two thousand. Right, right, right. So, if you take a look at how much it's grown, make everything just work the way it was supposed to work, and they try to introduce something in, they pounded and pounded and pounded. They could have, they could have been more synergistic. Or, I'm trying to think of her. Had more synergy with the with the 
with like Rome Disc, for example. On the construction side, that was their big thing. You know, right. the big Rome Disc, and you know, Rome Disc made agriculture stuff. They could have set dealers up that way with all that stuff instead of a dealer trying to go out and try to find a sunflower or something else like that. They could have uniquely done that. I just feel like had they done some things a little bit differently, obviously, that would have been it would have made a bigger splash in the market. And to and to put it in current day, of course, you're looking at a completely different world in eighty seven versus now, mm-hmm. which is what, thirty years? Yeah. Thirty one years. A couple of years ago, versatile comes out with a combine. Right? Mm-hmm. They're not just all over the place, you know. For U.S. American ag market share, there's not a lot of those running around. That cat articulated four-wheel drive tractor would have been in that same world, you know. Other than hey, it's cat. We just made this. Check this out, and you get a lot of the glazed-over eyes effect because of that. But you, it's the same market scenario. As, really. as introducing a new combine when there's so many other combines already there. What's the benefit? What's the what's the one biggest differentiator between the versatile combine and and the mythical cat articulated tractor? What's the biggest difference? If I'm a, if I'm a combine guy, I'm a custom cutter. I want to go mm-hmm. get a combine. I'm going to go run my combine, a versatile combine. My combine breaks down in Wichita Falls, Texas. How far do I have to go to get to a versatile guy who's got parts? Right. Okay? Right. How far do I have to go to get parts if I'm, my cat breaks down? You don't know. It was 31 years ago. The the, the, the cat map hasn't changed all that well, much. Well, I, I, under, you know. I understand that. You you can run to, you know, if you're in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, you right. run to Gary and you got parts. Right. You know? Hey, right. I grabbed a sandwich and a final drive. And I had to drive across the river. Right. <laughs> right. But... So I, I get your point on that. Yeah. It's it's dealer network, it's service, you know, it's all that. Dude, that's why there's think about this Vermeer Baylor. Let's take that. It's a great example. Okay. It's a great example in my book of, of a in my opinion, a quality piece of equipment, you know. And it goes out and does what it's supposed to do and, and does what it do does what it's supposed to do, right? But if it breaks down, I gotta go find Ted's welding shop somewhere to go pick up parts and right. Ted might not have the part at all period right that's been the biggest downfall to that whole entire dealer or you have an agco dealer yeah who also happens to be a vermeer dealer right now what do you think they have more parts on the shelf they're heston by mass or massey ferguson by heston baylor (laughs) right or they're vermeer (laughs) yeah because because guess what the bigger shinier fancier sign out in front is yep you know but it's also market population Mm-hmm. Right, you know, you know, so but you're like, you, you're splitting hairs on the, those two examples for market population. No, you're not. On a round baler, you certainly are. What do you mean? I I would say it's almost equal market population between the Massey Ferguson by Heston baler and the Vermeer baler. You, you gotta be kidding me! No, how many Massey balers do we look at on trade and Gina compared to Vermeers? A fraction. I mean, it's fun, right? I mean, we look at way more Massey Ferguson in this pocket. Any po- dude, I've worked here and in Kansas. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's almost the same pocket. Whether I'm down in South Central Kansas <laughs> or Western Nebraska, I look the exact na- same number of. of that's not. Baby. That's not even fair because Why? you were you were in their back. Wait, John Deere still had not dominated day, the marketplace. On a, on a windy day, you could spit and hit the factory. As long as it was coming out of the south. Well, yeah, not a north wind, obviously. But I, I can tell you this much, that we still dominated the whole marketplace. John Deere did. Where, you, where did John Deere bailers come into this? We were talking about Heston and Massey. But what I'm saying is, like, you talk about market domination, right? Oh, it's all deer. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the end of the day is, when you start looking at, well, it depends on if you're talking about big square balers or brown. I'm bailers. talking about a five by six round baler, the number of he- Massey Ferguson by Heston balers and the number of Vermeer balers. What Just if I'm running those run, two. What if I want to run a Challenger? What are they called? Oh, please don't. For, <laughs> probably an RB56. RB56, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's please. a Massey Ferguson by Heston by Challenger. Please don't. <laughs> 
But you look at that marketplace, dude, and across the board, the ratio is the same. I don't care. I, don't, I really don't care where you live at. My opinion, and I've, I've been in two different markets, two different, distinctly different marketplaces, and I've looked at just the same amount of Vermeer Baylor's that I looked at in Kansas that I have looked at in Western Nebraska. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Okay. In your face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but long and short of it is, dealer network would played a huge part in that. Absolutely. In that whole deal, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't until you. This is because I've yet to take time to learn about it. I forgot the Vermeer, Vermeer or Vermeer versatile man combine. Because <laughs> when you were saying, I was like, why on earth would you want to? Not because I don't think there's anything wrong with the product, but why would you want to buy one? Okay, Kansas boy, what's inside the versatile combine? guessing something from kansas since you do it that way by your odor oh there you go yeah that's true yeah yep but then it in north central kansas yeah oh boy that's true that's true but or just kind of a mix of homelands right there yeah it's kind of you are from the southern yeah. central part of nebraska yeah well, they say you know what to say about people from that part of the world mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> I think when you leave Wichita, uh, keep going north, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my my uh my opinion of that is, if you bought that versatile combine, unless the dealer is right next to you, what are you gonna do if it breaks? How far is someone gonna come to fix that? How long are you gonna be down <laughs> to get the parts that you need to have before you back up and run it? Right. And when you're cutting wheat. That's a pretty time sensitive crop to get out of the field, right? Yep. So, and you're looking off to the south and you see these nice black billowing clouds coming at you with lightning bolts coming down, catching things on fire all over the place. And you're like, gosh, you'd like to get my weed out, but I can't. It's another two days before I get my parts. I'm going to go to the shed and get out my old Masseys and hammer down. I'm going to get out my Reapers, start getting a tattoo. <laughs> <Reapers. laughs> Uh, all right, Janice, you trying, what do you think? What do you think about this conversation we've had thus far? I'm just taking this all in because a, the... a lot of this happened before my time on this earth, so. Oh, my God, she's right. That is right. Wow. Because you were born in what, 2010? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> but you know what? I can remember. I remember this so very mm-hmm. clearly. At the 1987 Husk mm-hmm. Harvest days, you know, little machinery dork running around just drooling all day. At the field demo, they had a Kinsey uh, 640 soft track, which was like the first grain cart on tracks from the factory, you know, hooked to a 65. And that was all, if I remember right, everything there, especially at that time, was ridge tilled, you know, yep. and it was just peaked. So that, that uh, cat and that Kinsey get their load and they just turned right across the rows and just and you see the bogeys and everything just going crazy and he's just sitting in the seat and everybody's like that is so cool yep you know that was that was like all anybody could talk about for the longest time caterpillar made it and i cannot for the life of me remember what it's called vrs 250 that's, implement that's it yep it's you can put honey wagons on it grain carts on it yeah it was just an implement trailer on tracks. Yeah. Basically all it was. Yep. And you could hook up whatever you wanted to. And there were a lot of guys back home, back in that late 80s, early 90s thing, they would get those and they would use those to spread manure. Mm-hmm. They'd get in the field when it was still oh, yeah. kind of nasty out. You yep. know what I mean? And long before they'd get a wheel tractor out there. And they'd go out and do all that stuff. And they were also doing the same thing with um, uh, uh, top dressing. They could get in the field when oh, it was yeah. when mm-hmm. just completely nasty. But, but still too soft to get a wheel tractor out there. And they'd have the big 36-inch tracks on there or whatever and just kind of go. But it was, I don't know, it was pretty cool. I had a few of those come across my desk back back in the day. <laughs> but it was, you know, so it was it was a, it was pretty neat. That well, was a pretty neat deal. Okay, neat. say They're, Mr. What If. So, <laughs> Cap... Well, that totally destroys my thing. I was going to Go ahead, say, let's talk about it. Huh? Let's go ahead and let's talk about it. Cat comes out with, what if they build both? Wheel and track, take your pick. I think they could have easily. And then they go buy 
Go buy J and M. Go buy Sunflower. Buy Krause. Buy somebody. Any of those. And pretty soon, mm-hmm. look at us. Yeah. We're a we're a major. And we just started yesterday. I think that would have been the I think the one thing that, that Caterpillar did in the shortcoming was when they built that track machine, they built the horsepower ranges they were already gonna compete against. Right? So instead of being like, okay, we're gonna build a we're not gonna wait for the ninety five E to come out and have the four hundred and fifty horsepower tractor then. We're gonna do it now. Right. We're gonna mm-hmm. build that four hundred and fifty horsepower tractor in eighty seven. We're gonna offer out, we're gonna have a three hundred, a three fifty, or four hundred and four fifty. Those are your four choices. And you guys take your pick which one you want. But instead they started out with a um two fifty? Yeah, I think it's two fifty and then like three hundred, three fifty, something like that. And that's kind of where it was. I, I can't remember. It's been so long since so I went back and looked, but like the 55, 4, 35, 45, 55, I don't think those came out until like the 90s. Yeah, 90s, mid 90s. That was when that, Mid to late 90s. That was when they, off, they, they, they kind of took the track thing to the next level where they used their same high track right. technology that you see everywhere now that were on the bulldozers. And I think if they'd done that to start with, so the whole high track deal would have been. At a high, on a bigger frame, on a higher horsepower deal, because that was like they did with the what was that the the D? Yeah, the D. Mm-hmm. The D was the first big big frame high track. Yep, I think so. Yep, an eighty eighty five D. No, no. The first high track big high track machine would have been an MT. MT. They didn't they didn't high track yeah. them until MT. Yeah, right? so the MT yeah. and that so even the uh, ninety yeah because even the ninety five E is a flat track. And that was the, the 95E was the last generation of pure caterpillar. Pure caterpillar because in 2001 it was no yeah 2001 that's when Adco took over and they made the MT 700 series the MT 800 series and did that whole thing. So it was up until that point, but they never released a high track machine until the MTs came on the high horsepower side, right. high frame stuff. And that's when you started seeing guys, and especially like in Canada. We're taking the MT 835, 845, even some 865s and spreading them out, putting 18 inch belts on them and, and running their whatever that was 500 horsepower tractor, 400 horsepower tractor with 18 inch belts, which is commonplace now. But back then they were burning up bogies and drive wheels and everything because right. they weren't designed, right. they weren't designed to, to handle that kind of stuff. So, it was, or for your other what if, okay, so. We come onto the market with a splash with a 500 horsepower tractor, mm-hmm. articulated mm-hmm. track, whatever. We'll put that to bed. And everybody stands around and goes, well, that's fine, but I don't need anything. You know, nobody makes anything that needs that much horsepower. Right. Oh, wait, we do. Yeah. We make our own stuff because yeah. we bought Krauss or Sunflower or whatever. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> we make our own implements for that big tractor. Because that would have been, that was the other thing too. The other negative of that is, when they rolled that tractor, that's all they offered you. Right. It was a tractor. That's, that's it. it. So they kind of had to build to what was out there. They couldn't be like, oh, we're going to build this 500 horsepower or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you're going to step back and go, that's great. I can now pull my 25-foot disc faster <laughs> than I can pull my, with my three. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, I mean, you could have had 60-foot air seeders in 1987. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? You could have had 42-foot discs and everything else you see that's commonplace now that just wasn't there because the horsepower wasn't there yep. they would have reinvented a, like a whole niche and they would have had to have been all in with that because they would have had to come to the table and say alright this well, is long term we're going to make this work and you think okay and you think about it alright you go through all the trouble to build that tractor basically from scratch okay I mean obviously they got stuff to do it with but you're entering, entering a market you haven't been in in ages, years and years and years and years and years, decades, and just build the tractor and set it there and go, okay. You go through all that trouble to do that, put the support stuff with it, and we'd be looking at a very different marketplace than we would be today. Oh, yeah. I mean, that would have been, you know, it'd be completely most they would have bought agco yeah instead of agco buying the possibly or or agco would have gone out of business you know what i mean they wouldn't have had the opportunity to buy deutsch and just started just this 15 years you got that backwards 
Oh, that's right. I do have it backwards. Sorry. But that <laughs> that whole run that they made for that 10 year run where every year they acquired a new company. Right. There might not have been the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's. What ifs are fun because you can always be right. Oh, yeah. that's the great thing about what ifs. <laughs> All right. This continues my streak. <laughs> always, always a winner. Always a winner in the what if game, right? <laughs> you take the facts that you have and you twist them until you get them right. All right, well. All right, here's another what if. Well, not really a what if, but while we're on the topic of things that could have been, would have been, days gone by, today's the anniversary mm -hmm. of the last international tractor built yeah i saw that on machinery machinery peach yeah, yeah. yeah. saw that a 5488 mechanical front yeah yeah so what's your what if i don't have a what if oh that was just you make no i try to be i try to be non <clears throat> what do you always get on to me for it non nonpartisan 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 <laughs> yeah. i try to be nonpartisan on machinery colors while we're doing this so don't really have a what if to to share if, I, if yeah. I'm to stay nonpartisan. <laughs> I also didn't comment on Greg's post because of that. We don't vote in elections either. That way we stay partisan and when we cover we cover debates and stuff. <laughs> you know what's bad though, and this is this is you know obviously after that backhanded comment, I'm not an IH man. Mm -hmm. Um. That the the worst part about that whole world is is they were they are so many struggles so many struggles with IH and Tenneco buys them you know and then you have your case tractor painted red and then all of a sudden they come out with a Magnum that guess what it's a fifty four eighty eight they just finished it mm -hmm. you know what if which was also in nineteen eighty seven hell of a year that what if that magnum comes out what what if ih wasn't struggling so damn bad and in 1981 the magnum comes out instead of the 88s what if they had the magnum done and they didn't come out with the 88s and their backwards door and sort of kind of power shift not really what if what if the magnum comes out then oh i mean what what would have what would be the, so they put the door that opens the other way. I mean, what what do we? Well, it's a superior machine. The old Magnums, right? Like seventy one thirty, seventy one forty. Right. So what 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 is your what's your basis here? That IH wouldn't have died. So if they rolled out the Magnum, and when the eighty eight come out, right? If the Magnum come out, eighteen speed full power shift in nineteen eighty one. Yeah. Full power shift. Okay, somebody else had an eight-speed full power shift, and right. didn't have a fifteen until eighty-three. Right. So they have a two-year jump. Don't you think up to that point in nineteen eighty-seven that they roll out one tractor that somehow that's gonna that would have saved the whole entire company? Yes. That that one tractor would have just been like, "Yep, we're gonna. This is a hinge point here for for case or I'm sorry, international without power question." Power. That it would have saved the whole company. I do. I honestly do. I am, and I am not a red guy. For God's sakes, I am in no way, shape, or form an IH fan. I, I think by 1987 that they were so far down that road. They were no, they died in '85. I'm talking about '81 when the '88s came out. Okay, all right. The '88 was the half-ass Magnum. I don't know, man. I think that they would have been rolling out a brand new tractor that they would have had to hinge themselves on in a horribly depressed ag economy. Right. That if they didn't have the cash, the capital to maintain what they had, I don't know that they could have weathered the storm any more than maybe they could have hung out for a couple more years, maybe found a few more investors or something like that. But I don't think that they would have. I think it would have been such a landslide change that it would have. I think it would have been. I really think you're right. I, mean, I think it would have. Like how many, God bless, how many guys are still drinking the Farmall Kool-Aid? A lot of that, too, is, is not necessarily, it's a reminiscence. I think about, I think back to when I played football, and I should have been in the NFL, but the minds that I have in my 
the stories I have in my head. Well, duh. And then I start thinking about it. I'm like, I was. That didn't I just really chose not to go. Right <laughs> I chose not to go. I look Pat, back. I look Pat back. Pat Bowen like, called me, and I'm like, eh, I'm gonna go to ag school. You know, I look at the combine. <laughs> I watch what these guys. I look at the combine. And I watch what these guys bench press. I'm like I could do that when I was their age. It's like, but I couldn't run the four seven forty at three hundred fifty pounds either. So you know, I could do the forty and not the bench press. <laughs> <laughs> the point of being is those guys have that reminiscent thought process in their head of that's what they grew up farming with. Just like your first car you had. Think about back when you had the, your first car. My first car I had was really a pile of crap. It's an old 81 Chevy pickup. Oh. And it was beautiful. And I loved it. And it had been, it, it was the best thing since sliced bread. And I think about it today and I'm like, this that was the greatest vehicle I ever owned. I wouldn't have given $250 for it ah. then. In today's money, right? So we're talking, but it ran good, it was loud, and I had a lot of shenanigans take place with that truck involved in it. Oh, lots surely of, not. Lots of shenanigans. But when I think back on it, I'm like, it's the best vehicle I ever had in my life. I think a lot of that old tractor talk that you hear guys talk about all the time, Well, it's them I- thinking back about... To a point in time when it was awesome. Obviously, I have I own three Massey Fergusons for shit's sakes. Same right. thing, okay? <laughs> Same damn thing. But what I, I that's not what I was getting at with the the Kool Aid drinkers. I mean, there's there's so many. I H okay, Case I H. I H was far, 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 far and away the stronger company right. with a bigger following. Because by 1985, Case was just what we were talking about with Cat. Here's your tractor. That's it. That's all we got. Now, they had the full line of tractors from 5 to 400 horse. But that's all they had. And Tenneco owned them, mm-hmm. you know, for years. That's why Tenneco bought IH. Combine, planner, tillage, you know, all that. IH already had all this stuff. They just needed a tractor that wasn't a giant turd. Right. Okay. Okay. They had that tractor. They had it. They built it. They tested it. They would have rolled that out. Here we go. I don't think so. I think so. I think I just think because I really of their, do. I don't. Not so much that I don't think they could have made sales. They could have made enough sales to cover their R and D and all the other costs of operations because of the situation they were in in 1981. 1980, 1979. I don't think they could have recovered fast enough in the economy they're in. Had they done that 1976 and rolled that out, they probably never would have happened. They would have made they would have cleared through the 80s just fine. They would have got a good following. All that stuff would have happened just fine. They were in such a financial stress point in that particular moment in time that had they even, I don't care what they did, I don't think they could have recovered. Not in that economy. I think they could have. I don't think. I just. Don't I think they could have. have. They would just have had because find, they would have had to merge with somebody else, or they would have had to find an outside investor that would have done something differently, because they would have been buying them, not merging with them. I don't think so. I think that would have been a big enough splash to save them. Because I think it would have been a big enough splash to save them for right. a couple of years till they found that ex person to buy them. No, it wouldn't have been because when the from 1961 Dallas, Texas, 1960, the 4010 3010 come out. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was the death of International. That day, they didn't know it for 25 years, but that was the death. Okay, because John Deere cared about operator comfort, not just how much power can we put to the ground. Right. Okay, and the. That that was the initial death. The second death was when the 30 series came out. Sound guard body, console controls, all of that. What was your IH offering at the time? The throttle behind the steering wheel, the gear shifter way up here that ground in every gear, a TA. Mm-hmm. Don't get me started on TAs. They lost guys to Deer, probably to Alice, probably to Massey, whoever. Certainly to Massey. Through that period, starting in they starting in sixty for sure in seventy three. Okay, that if they would have brought out that tractor in eighty one, 
they would have gotten so many of those guys back. Okay. The guys who are all green now, but they're collector tractors or farm alls because mm -hmm. that's what they used to have. Right. But they jump ship and never look back. And why would they have? Had they have come out with that then, they would have got so many of them guys back. Here we go. Yeah. That's that's probably a good a good point. That's they would have gotten back so many guys that lost. Yeah, I think you're probably there's some you probably say have. It, say it. No, I said I said you're right. I mean there you're you probably go. right if you would have taken a look at it from that, that perspective. But my point is in nineteen eighty one they were so far down the path of holy shit, what do we do? They couldn't have they couldn't have come out of it. They would have they had to roll that they, because oh. here's why. Okay, I'm listening. They okay. come out with the eighty eight and hung on for four years. Four years in eighty eight. Or with the with the eighty eight series. Mm -hmm. Sorry, technically it's called the yeah five five thousand series. Okay, but they already had by, by if that. If they'd have had the Magnum, here we go. So you're saying they rolled that out the eighty eight out four years after nineteen eighty one? No, they rolled the eighty eight out in eighty one and hung on until eighty five with that. But they also had but case and the whole deal was happening then. They didn't buy... That was an 85. I understand. But they were going down that path. They they weren't they weren't going to save themselves. They were already there, bro. You're talking about two different things. Had they come out with a Magnum <laughs> in 81, boom. If they had come out the, the, the 88 in 76, they probably would have changed their whole outcome. Well, the first thing they should have done is never come out with 86 in 76. That would have been, that would have been stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is... I hope Dave Gibson watches this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, point, the point I'm making is that it, by the time that they hit that point in time, they were they had done all they could do. I Yeah, I you have a very, very valid point. I'm just saying... <clears throat> I know. I don't know they would have had enough capital to fit the production schedule they need to have to produce enough tractors to save them with what they needed to do. That's why the Magnum didn't come out. They didn't have the money to finish it. Yep. And that, you know, so had they come. But that's my whole what if. What if they had the money to finish it? <laughs> but my, what I'm saying to you is that had they had enough money to finish it and they were just scraping the bottom barrel to get to go out, I still don't think they would have had enough. Of the of the particular struggle that they were in at that point in time, I don't think they could have done it. My what if is if they had enough money to finish that tractor and un, and unveil not unveil release it, start selling magnums. That's my what if. Right. They'd still be around today. So would the DeLorean Motor Company. Maybe so. But in order to make ends meet, oh boy, had to start. Still dealing some pharmaceuticals to make things work, right? So if you had enough capital to keep that thing going, we'd all have time machines. <laughs> we would, you know? But I also think in the 80s, look at what the farm economy was, too. Like, right. it wasn't, it's, you know, very similar to kind of where we're at now. It's yep. just we're more in a liquid oh, place. Oh, no. Than, we were way, you know, way, 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 way it worse. It was way worse, but... Because of the 80s, we're in a better position than what we are, what we were back then. Well, yeah. You know, people have learned from history. But in the 80s, it was definitely bad. some people bad. haven't. And some people <laughs> haven't. But, you know, the economy wasn't good during that time frame either to oh, support was... all that new equipment. That's why, that's my that's my point. Like, they would have not, their cash flow situation, mm -hmm. had they even been able to get enough people to sign up to buy stuff, there wouldn't have been enough production run to, to save them. There would have been. Otherwise, John Deere would have folded too. But John Deere already had a good solid. They, they their production run that they had, they had a good following at that, that point. They had good numbers. So did International. That's my point. But, but John Deere wasn't in a financial situation. I realize that. That's my why. whole damn what if is if IH had the money to release that tractor and start selling that tractor, start producing that tractor, they'd still be around today. And I get your what if. What I'm saying is even if even if they would have produced that tractor. That's why John Deere is still around today. If, that's why Alice isn't. That's why Massey had 37 different owners between 83 and today. Right. 
That's it, why they didn't have they were, didn't have the cash. That's why they kept failing. My, I, mean, I agree with your what if. That had they had that tractor, there would have been. If you agreed with it, you wouldn't still be arguing. No, with what me. I'm, my point I agree with you is <laughs> the point that I'm agreeing with is I agree with what you're saying. That had they produced that tractor, it would have changed things, but not enough to save them. Yeah, they still would have well, failed. Well, I'm right and you're wrong. That's fine. Or I'm wrong and you're right. It's, it's a what two. if. What did you just say? I said everybody. I'm wrong. Everybody's right with a yeah, what if. That's right. <laughs> everybody's a winner. <laughs> Unless you're wrong, I, like I said, I think it valid point what you're making. I, they're financially, even if the what if would have happened, I don't think they could have survived it. And I think they could have. All right. Anyway, I think they could have. I think they could have been number one. I think it would have been so drastic they'd be number one. I really do. If they had had the capital to, to mainstream, all they had to do is come out with it and support it. But heck, you have to have capital to do that. That's my what if, Casey. I get your what if, but you have your what if still has a parameter. You can't say like we're going to produce unicorns today, and they're all going to be on delivered on rainbows. <laughs> it can't happen. There's got to be some. There's got to be a, a line of not of, in a what if. There doesn't. Yes, there has to be some level of 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 reality to your what if to make it work. There is. And, and I'm, I agree with your what if statement that yes, it would have changed dramatically, changed the company, but not enough to save it. It'd be number one. You know what? Hey, look at that. I didn't even do this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Right on. All right. Well, I think we beat this one to death. Boy, I think it was beat to death a couple minutes ago. Well, we've gone 56 minutes and 37 seconds so far. So I there feel like we've beat this one to death. Oh, yeah. All right. So, Aaron. Any final words before we shut it down? I don't. Okay. God bless. Thank God. Gina, anything? I hope everybody's still listening. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, they want to find you on the internet. where they go. On uh, Twitter, at Aaron Fintel, or uh, my cell phone, 308-760-1193. Right on. Uh, Regina Nargis on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Okay. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Movie Nine LLC. You can also go to Movie Nine LLC for more information on the Movie Nine Summit in Las Vegas this year, past and present episodes of the Moving Iron podcast. And if you really want to, you can go read a blog in there. Real nice. Top notch. Real nice. I mean, the penmanship grammar, it's just amazing. It's, it'll <laughs> blow your mind. Anyway. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so, till next time, let's go move some iron. I'm Casey Seymour. I'm Aaron Fennell. Regina Nargis. Out. <laughs>